And when we think CATF around here, we think Peggy McCowan. Good morning, Peggy. How are you? Good morning. I'm well. How are you all? We are really well, and even better now that you're a part of the program again. Good morning to you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is this is what, year five for you, Peggy, in charge? Uh, no, year three. Year three. Oh, I just moved you ahead a couple of years there. It seems like five some days, huh? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you are set to go. If you could give us the rundown yeah. on the dates and the plays you're featuring at uh, the festival this summer. Sure. So we open on July 5th, and then we run through the month of July. So our last shows are July 28th. We will have some Pay What You Want previews that we'll announce soon uh, that will start before the 5th. So people should be looking for those. And this year we're doing three plays and an offering in two parts. And uh, we'll be at the Shepherdstown Opera House again with a play called The Happiest Man on Earth by Mark St. Germain, who has been with us before. Mm -hmm. He wrote a play called Scott and Hem in the Garden of Allah that opened the Marinoff Theater, actually. And uh, that play is about... A Holocaust survivor. It's actually based on the uh, true story written by Eddie Jacku. And it, I know on the surface, will sound to people like a play that seems challenging. And there definitely are some stories that he shares about escaping uh, various situations during the Holocaust. But it really is a, an amazing story of sort of love and life and the understanding of how precious life is. And so it's very uplifting, I think. Um, and then with uh, that, we have in the Marinoff Theater, Enough to Let the Light In by Paloma Nazika. And this is the story of two women who are very much in love, who are having a big moment because Cynthia is inviting Mark to her home for the first time. And as the evening progresses, we hear wonderful things from them and great stories. And then we start to hear some truths revealed that start to question what's happening in the relationship and also uh, maybe what's happening in this house. So it's sort of a psychological thriller. It's a little creepy. And uh, if you like that sort of genre, this is absolutely a play that you should see. Well, that uh, then, uh, before you go on, Peggy, uh, would, would that be like almost uncomfortable to watch? If you like, you're kind of like eavesdropping on a conversation you're, you kind of want to listen to, but no, you shouldn't be. Um, I, not uncomfortable, but a little just scary. Like you don't know exactly what's going on or where this is going to go. It feels a little. Hitchcock. -like. Got, gotcha. Um, yeah. Okay. So then um, in the Studio 112, we're doing a piece called Tornado Tastes Like Aluminum Sting by Harmon Dot Ott. And this is about a family who are um, sort of living in Kansas and dealing with a child who has autism and how to sort of help them reach their dreams and their goals of being a filmmaker. So we watch this child sort of develop into creating their own work. And, of course, as the title would suggest, there's a tornado coming and looming in the distance. And so everything sort of wraps up with um, the impact of this tornado. But it also is very fun and um, a very loving family kind of story. And then in the Marinoff Theater, we're doing this offering in two parts. So you can actually come and see part one, and uh, there's a supper interval that you can join us for dinner on the patio and then go in and see part two. And this is the story of a couple uh, in 1986 who are very much in love as well, and they discover that they are at the same time pregnant and that the husband has contracted AIDS. And so the first part is about how they sort of survive and manage through this discovery of AIDS and managing the disease. And then the second part is 30 years later, and we meet the son. 
So it's a little bit of a discussion about how AIDS and HIV are still uh, a disease and a, and a challenge in our communities today, and particularly how it's impacted the black communities and legacies of families. But it is also a story about family. It's also a story about faith. It's also a story about how we love each other, even in challenging circumstances. So it's really a beautiful play. And you have a bonus play you're doing this year? Yes, we do. We have uh, a play that is really a partnership with the Appalachian Chamber Music Festival. And that is sort of an installation music piece. And so there is kind of an art element around it. And then there is the music performance. And this is with a company called Musica Ireland. And this is actually their American debut. Cool. Now, I'm going to go to uh, a season ticket holder here now in John Gilstrap because he, as a person who's a best-selling author himself, totally grooves on this stuff. Actually, I do. Uh, <laughs> we, we had such a good time. We went to all the, the um, shows last year. Uh, and like any live theater, some are, I, I enjoyed some more than, than others. Some I, I really, really liked a great deal. Some I didn't get, mm -hmm. one in particular. But mm -hmm. um I really encourage people, first of all, I'll do a commercial for you. Live theater, for me, I think is, is, is very special. These are all small venues. They're intimate venues. Uh, and there's just there's just nothing like it. Uh, so the, you know, it's, it's not, these aren't shows you've ever seen before. In all likelihood, they're not shows you're going to see again, which isn't a, a, a quality statement. It's just, it's just truly a unique experience. So uh, not horribly expensive to go to. We've already got all of our tickets. I, I forget when we're going exactly. I didn't actually buy them, but we, my wife took care of that. Um, but I, I, what I think is interesting about these is they, uh, they explore, they're not commercial for the most part. And I, I haven't seen these. Mm -hmm. so obviously, it's not a review. So my question to you is when I presume you read a lot of plays more than watching a lot of plays to decide which ones you're going to choose. So what is, what are you looking for? What floats to the top? Mm -hmm. is, is it just the writings of the characters is a theme? Yes. What, what are you looking for? I think for me, the, the first thing that I look for, or really it's what I respond to is if something has really moved me, if it has the power to evoke a strong emotional response, that's one thing that I respond to is that that feeling that I've been touched in a way that um, something hasn't moved me before and that there's some surprise in the story. And so it, it's kind of the powerfulness of it. It's the surprise of it. And then it is really the story. Is there something that has made me think about life a little differently or helps me to see things a little differently and help me be really in some ways a more open, more receiving colleague to my fellow human beings. So um, not, these plays particularly are very poetic in some ways. Um, and also there's humor. Like, have I enjoyed the experience of reading them? Now, <clears throat> excuse me, last year, one play in particular, it invi and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the title of it, but it involved a jailhouse interview. Uh, right. Confronting, mm -hmm. right, confronting her, a, a woman confronting her brother's killer, I think. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. And as I was watching that, it was by far my favorite show of, of, the, of the set. And as I was watching this, as a writer, I was watching this, and I'm thinking, how much of this was, was the actor's? And, and their performance and how much of this was from the writer's pen, which is actually a compliment to both of them. Mm -hmm. Do these plays then go on to other things? Is it, are these plays auditioning essentially to greater things, to, to larger venues? And, and do they, in fact, advance? Yes, they do. So that play, for example, we are producing it in New York in September. So it opens September 21st at a theater called 59E59. And so that is sort of the first move that we're making with it. And 
definitely we have had other theaters already ask about that and are pursuing producing it. Um, Your Name Means Dream has already moved, I think, to two or three other theaters for this season coming up. So everything that we did last year is either in progress of another show or is moving somewhere um, this upcoming season in theaters. Which is another reason, folks in, out there listening, to go and see these. You never know that you know what it is you're you're watching. Years ago, my wife and I went to see this un little show that nobody had ever heard of called Dear Evan Hansen that was in at, I think in uh-huh. down on Main Avenue in, in DC. I forget what that that venue is called, and it's done really well, right? It's it's burning down, yeah. it, it burning down New York right now. So if if nothing else, you get to see the the first iteration of of the next hit. I, mm-hmm. Peggy, mm-hmm. a few years ago, uh, as senior citizens, uh, b- uh, my wife and I went to Disneyland and uh, or Disney World, and we did not want to stand in line, so we took a series of backstage tours. And to me, that's been the more and the most memorable part of any trip I've been on. I see you're doing the same thing here. You have there's an opportunity for a backstage tour of what's going on. There's an opportunity for uh, uh, breakfast with Peggy. Uh, CATF in, con- in context. So there's numerous opportunities besides just this, uh, the shows themselves. Would you speak to these uh, these opportunities and what you hope to provide the general public? Mm-hmm. So we really want people to have the opportunity to talk about the plays and to talk about the experience and really be immersed in what it is to make plays like this. And so we provide every opportunity we can for people to ask questions about the play, ask questions about playwrights, ask questions about how the festival works, to see the sort of behind the scenes making of these plays so that people feel like they are a part of the experience. And what we know is that when people begin to understand the importance of supporting new work like this and helping the theater canon across the country grow, that they want to come and see these plays. And they're willing to then experience things that they know are not quite baked or things that they maybe think was not their cup of tea, but they appreciate the value of that because they have that total experience and total access to being part of CATF. Peggy McCown is our guest here. We're talking about the Contemporary American Theater Festival, which runs in uh, the month of July every summer here out of Shepherdstown. Go ahead, Bill. No, I was just looking at your board of directors. Uh, there's some very, uh, not only you have uh, uh, a lot of local folks here, you have a very impressive group of uh, board of directors. How active is your board uh, with setting the, uh, selecting the plays uh, and, uh, and making sure everything works appropriately? Well, we have a very active board, but they don't have anything to do with selecting the plays. (laughs) So their role really is to help us maintain um, a good business model and to be financially responsible and to help us ensure that we can continue to produce the art that we're producing. And they are very involved and they have the opportunity to experience sort of what we're doing with the art, but they do not select the art. How are the art selected? What's the process? Well, right. So I lead that process and I go to many new play readings across the country Um, What Will Happen to All That Beauty is a reading that I saw two years ago at the Goodman Theater in Chicago. And some of those plays come from that experience when I've seen a reading and I thought, oh, that's a play that we really should produce. Sometimes I receive scripts from agents or other directors or uh, people that we trust within the industry. And sometimes we are submitting reading opportunities for grants. So Tornado Tastes Like Aluminum Sting is actually one of three winners of the Venturist Playwriting Fellowship Award. And we as a theater were given 50 plays to read. 
And then out of that 50, I had to pick one to reach out to the playwright to discuss, to determine whether we wanted to build this play together and then submit the grant. And so they come from some different directions, but I do the major list of reading everything and sort of identifying what I think we should produce. And normally you got, you're producing four this year. Uh, in times past, I think for five, maybe even six one year. Uh, what's the reason for, how do you determine the most appropriate number of plays to present? So this year, the what will happen to all that beauty is the one that is in two parts. And it actually, because of the two parts, is taking the slot of a fifth show. So we, in terms of our calendar and our schedule, knew that that's how that would have to work. And so that's part of what determined how the season would go. Part of it is scope and scale of the work we have to figure out what we can manage in terms of a workload with the personnel that we have so that we're ready for audiences to come. And so it's kind of a balancing act. And each season we take a look at the potential lineup of plays and figure out the best way it will work in our calendar and with our personnel to produce. And that's sort of what determines the number. Peggy, when do these uh, actors all come into town? Where do they stay when they're here in Shepherdstown? Because we do know that you're bringing in equity actors from all around to fill these roles in these plays. Right. So the whole company this year is about 130. When you think about all the production staff and everything in addition to the actors, everybody for the most part is here now. We have had people here since about mid-May. And they stay everywhere we can find housing. So there are some of them that are on the Shepherd University campus in the residence hall apartments and in the suites. And then there are folks in Airbnbs and cottages and people's apartments and everywhere. And do we have any familiar actors or actresses who have been in plays previously who are back this year? No, we actually don't have any returning actors this year. They're all brand new. Go ahead, John. A uh, question from our Facebook page. Uh, any plays especially appropriate or inappropriate for, say, 16 and under? Um, I would say that um, what will happen to all that beauty because it has a love scene and nudity that May, people may want to think about that. Um, but otherwise, the other shows, I, I don't think so. Of course, there are some adult themes, and so I think people need to determine whether that's right for their children and, and folks of that age. But everything else, I think, feels manageable. Do current events influence what plays you select from summer to summer, Peggy? I think in a way that is a little subconscious, they do. So what I mean by that is I don't go into the reading process saying, oh, it's an election year. I should look for things about elections. Um, but there definitely is something about what writers are saying about what's happening in the world at any given time that influences what may show up on the page. So I do think that there is something out there that kind of influences what I see in any given year, but I don't go into it consciously saying, I'm going to look for this this year. Have there been occasions where a, a, a play has been selected or all but selected, and then because of events you go, oh, that's probably not the right year for this play? Yes. <laughs> I figured it had to. <laughs> well, it's funny because it actually did happen for this season. We are co-producing a piece called Happy Fall with a company in L.A. And we were supposed to do it here first this season, and then they were going to do it after us. And just for a variety of reasons, we had to flip that. And so they're producing it in August, and then we'll do it next summer. And so that 
that was a real challenge to sort of rearrange both our schedule and their schedule. It was a challenge to rethink what our season was going to look like without that piece. Um, so, yes, things like that definitely happen. Along that theme, Peggy, are there advantages of being first or the advantages of being second, perhaps even third, of a, of a play being presented? Well, yes and no. <laughs> so when you produce it first, you do a lot of the preparatory work and you do a lot of the work to develop the piece. And in this situation, we're sort of jointly doing that. So we did a workshop with them earlier. Or they did a workshop. There's a lot of that back and forth. But if it is the first production, they are doing more right now in terms of casting and designing and all the things that will happen. And so we're helping to support them, but we're not actually doing it. So when we do it next year, the scenery and the video projection work that has been done in this first production will come to us. So that's work that we won't be doing. We may be tweaking it a little bit, but you're not doing all the major creating in that moment. So there are advantages and disadvantages. On the other hand, you know, they have the first opportunity to explore. And if we hire any of the actors from that production for our production, they may be set in a pattern that we want to change. So there are challenges in that regard, too. Within the community itself, within the uh, the actors and the writers and the like, is, uh, do you benefit by having a reputation of being the first to produce, or does this make any difference to the within the community? I think within the community, the reputation helps because people come with a certain amount of trust. And that is really important when people are doing a work for the first time. Playwrights want to go someplace where they believe that the company will support the work and will provide the resources and do everything they can to create the best first production of it. And so having a good reputation and having a place that has been created that artists know that they will have this opportunity is really important. Plus they know that our audiences are coming with an understanding of what a new play is. And our audiences are very supportive and very helpful and artists really appreciate that too and that is part of our reputation that we have a great audience that comes as well now does this bring employment opportunities for local actors and technical folks for the, or does the company come pretty much from outside yes i mean we try to hire as many people locally as we can and particularly some of the shepherd students so even in our overhire situation, we try to hire people locally because it is more effective for us to know that these people are here and available at certain times than trying to shop around and then bring somebody in. So we do try to hire local people as much as we can. Peggy McCown has been our guest here in this half hour on the program. And uh, Peggy, any special showings or preview showings that you'll be doing this summer? Yes. Definitely previews will be announced soon, and we'll be doing some invited dresses for the happiest man on earth because they want to start a little sooner in their schedule with audiences. And then I just wanted to mention that tomorrow we're doing an event at the Opera House. Uh, Mark St. Germain, who wrote The Happiest Man on Earth, wrote a piece called Freud's Last Session, which was a very popular, well-known play that um, did sort of the theater circuit. That play has been made into a movie that he did the screenplay for. So we're going to screen the movie, and then he's going to talk about writing a play that then becomes a movie and, and the differences and what happens in that process. Oh, John, you could be a part of that, too. Well, except for the actually becoming a movie part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, Peggy, in regards to uh, a question John asked earlier about which plays are appropriate for certain age groups or whatever, are plays rated? Is there, is there a rating system for a play like there is for a movie that a parent can go on to the website and see, well, this is appropriate for my child or this is not? 
there isn't a rating system, but there is content information. So we have content information, and there's sort of the first line of that information. And if you really want to dig into it and get a little more information that's more specific, we have that available, too, on the website. All right. How do folks get tickets for this season's plays? You can go to CATF.org and go to our schedule and to the box office, or you can call the box office directly, which is also right there on the website for people to see. And uh, any information in regards to economic impact this has on the Eastern Panhandle this, this wonderful month that's coming up? Well, in our previous impact that was prior to the pandemic, it was $5.8 million. We are thinking that with inflation and so forth, it's probably significantly more now. Um, and we're hoping to do another economic impact in the next couple of years. So we'll have more accurate numbers. Peggy, wonderful, then, to, I think. wonderful to speak with you as always. All right. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Thank Peggy. you.